Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. My name is Hazel Gashoka, and I will be your mistress of ceremony tonight. Um, I'm a researcher at the Ontario Civil Liberties Association, which is abbreviated as OCLA. As someone who firmly believes in the universal principles that protect all individuals from the government and government-enabled arbitrary oppression, I'm extremely excited to be involved with OCLA. OCLA doesn't solely protect the civil liberties of those expressing the dominant proper position. They defend everyone. First and foremost, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for allocating time in your busy schedules to attend the 2017 OCLA Civil Liberties Award. Our special guest and award recipient is Jeanette. So today also marks um, OCLA's fifth year anniversary, and we'll hear from OCLA's Executive Director, Joseph Hickey, who will briefly tell us some highlights of OCLA's work over the past five years. Following Mr. Hickey, we will have the uh, Honorable Senator Kim Pate uh, introduce Jeanette, and uh, shortly thereafter, um, Jeanette will give us her acceptance speech, and then we'll have an open discussion period. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite OCLA's Executive Director, Mr. Joseph Hickey. So thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, as Hazel mentioned, I'd just like to give you a brief overview of what the OCLA is and the work that we've done uh, over the past five years of our existence. So we are an independent and completely volunteer-run rights and freedoms organization. And um, we uh, defend the rights and freedoms of all individuals. And so it all started when we uh, launched our statement of founding principles and created a web page and a Facebook group uh, back in the fall of 2012. And then we had our official launch event in January 2013 at the University of Ottawa. And since then, uh, we've been working very hard. And our work primarily involves um, Communing, communicating our position about civil liberties matters to the public um, and also to the media, but it's directed at institutions, uh, corporations, government entities, and other powerful groups uh, when those groups engage in actions that uh, remove the uh, civil liberties of individuals. And one of our key areas of focus is freedom of expression. And we take a very strong position uh, in defense of freedom of expression. And this is because we believe that true uh, free expression is essential for uh, the healthy functioning of a democratic society. And by healthy functioning, I mean uh, uh, the functioning that allows a society to retain its stability um, and to grow and adapt to changing circumstances. And so just quickly some highlights of our work over the past five years. Um, we have opposed the use of codes of conduct on university campuses uh, to censor and silence uh, students and other members of the university community. And one example of that happened just this week, in fact. Uh, a student named Masuma Khan had posted uh, things on Facebook that resulted in disciplinary proceedings where the university was using its uh, statutory power uh, to discipline the student over these Facebook uh, postings. We were at the uh, forefront of a protest that uh, uh, became a very uh, widespread uh, protest in the media. And a few days later, the university uh, dropped those charges and abandoned uh, the proceeding. So uh, we have uh, defended the rights of self-represented litigants, for example, to submit documents at court uh, in the same way that a party, a person represented by a lawyer, would have the right to do. And uh, self-represented litigants were being denied that right at the Supreme Court following our letter to the Chief Justice uh, that was uh, corrected, and uh, they were allowed to do so. Um, we have opposed prominent hate crime prosecutions um, in Canada, and by writing to the Attorneys General of Ontario and uh, BC. And so in this process, we've uh, developed reasoned, a reasoned argument why the hate crime provisions of Canada's criminal code are unconstitutional. And we've drawn on uh, international law decisions and statements of principle to do that. Um, we've been outspoken about police actions in Ontario, and we criticized legislation in 2014 that allowed police greater access to tasers. We also filed a uh, complaint at the, uh, the Office of the Independent Police Review Directorate um, over the uh, 
pressure imposed by the president of the Ottawa Police Union uh, by writing to the, uh, that, that uh, president wrote to the president of Carleton University uh, in order to pressure a professor to uh, cease his outspoken criticism of policing in Ontario. And we have published a detailed critique of the law of defamation in Ontario, and that was written by uh, one of our volunteer researchers, Dr. Denis Rancourt, who uh, is here and who helped uh, organize this event tonight as well. Um, we have done many other, uh, we've worked on many other topics, um, including uh, unjust deportation and extradition uh, proceedings, uh, we've uh, advocated for cameras in Ontario's courtrooms, and we have uh, worked on many other topics, and it's all documented and detailed on our website, which is ocla.ca. So another important part of our work is holding public events like this one tonight. And our most important event of the year is the annual Civil Liberties Award event. And it's now our fifth event, as we've had one uh, every year since our founding. And just quickly to uh, recap uh, who the past awards went to, uh, in 2013, our first Civil Liberties Award was uh, given to Mr. Harry Capito, who is a former lawyer and paralegal from Toronto, who has um, always been, uh, he's been a lifelong activist, uh, including for the right of paralegals and lawyers to be outspoken critics of the court system. In 2014, uh, we gave our second award to dominatrix Terry Jean Bedford, who is an advocate for the rights of sex workers, and who is one of the women uh, responsible for having the uh, prostitution provisions in the Criminal Code of Canada struck down. And our third award event was in Kingston, Ontario, and that was uh, given to Mrs. Connie Fournier, who is a conservative blogger and host of the discussion forum uh, freedominion.ca, who uh, went through very brutal and arduous uh, legal uh, lawsuits uh, against her uh, simply for hosting a forum for people to express their views. And, but she always uh, stood firm on her belief, her strong belief in freedom of expression throughout the entire ordeal. And that was a wonderful event with Mrs. Fournier. And last year's award was uh, Dr. Bruce Allen Clark, who spent his career um, trying to have the Canadian courts hear an argument that the uh, Indian Act of 1876, Canada's Indian Act, is unconstitutional. And so he was so determined to advance this argument, and the courts never heard it, but he was so determined that he ended up being jailed and uh, disbarred by the Law Society for uh, not letting go of this, uh, this argument. And so tonight, of course, we are honoring the amazing Jeanette Dasunian, whose uh, civil rights work has spanned many years in many areas. And we're, gonna, we're going to hear uh, much more about that in a few moments. And so, um, and I'm very excited to hear about that. And uh, that was my, uh, my overview of the first five years of the Oakla's work. Um, you can sign up to our email list uh, that's on the back table to get updates. And we plan to continue this work for many years. And so thank you for your support over the years and hope to see you uh, with us in the future. And uh, thank you all again and congratulations to Jeanette and enjoy the event. Thank you, Joseph. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Senator Kim Pate, who will introduce uh, OCLA's awardee, Jeanette Tassunian. Senator Pate's involvement and phenomenal work in defending the civil rights of prisoners hardly needs an introduction. For 35 years, Senator Pate has been an outspoken advocate for marginalized, criminalized, and institutionalized Canadians, in particular imprisoned youth, men, and women. Senator Pate has done incredible work at the Dalhousie Legal Aid Clinic, the John Howard Society of Calgary, and most notably as the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Senator Kim Pate. Thank you very much. I want to start uh, by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people, and. Um, it's a privilege to be on their territory and 
uh, particularly given who we're honouring, I think it's even more appropriate that we know the history of the territories we're on when for most of the past four decades that I've had the privilege of walking in, but most importantly being able to walk out of prisons for young people, prisons for men and prisons for women, the impact of colonization on Indigenous peoples in this country is um, horrific. And so as I stand here today, um, a full 25% of prisoners are Indigenous, but the number goes up to 39% if we're talking about women alone and 43% if we're talking about girls alone in juvenile custody. So that's a legacy that, of which we should not be proud. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about um, who's getting the Ontario Civil Liberties Award. And that is someone who I think um, many of us know and many of us um, look up to and, and I'm one of those. And so I'm very pleased to um, to be the one who Jeanette asked to um, introduce this and to help provide the award because um, Jeanette, you have been an amazingly vocal, resilient, talented, thoughtful, generous and kind advocate, ad activist, artist, all of the above, and I have no doubt that you will continue to do that. And I like to think that I can count you as a dear friend as well. So, Jeanette's lifelong career as an activist began in 1997, but that's not when I met her. Jeanette wrote to, um, to us at Elizabeth Fry and rightly said, basically, what are you doing about this and what are you going to do about this? And I need a lawyer and set about challenging us and me in particular um, to ensure that we supported her because it was, at, you know, from my perspective, absolutely ridiculous that someone was being locked in segregation because she didn't want to wear a bra. And if you haven't read about it, you'll see the, and I highly recommend that and many other stories are in the Human Kennel, one of the, the many publications of Jeanette's. But, um, so she was being put in segregation for refusing to wear a bra. When the, the hypocrisy was, almost everybody I knew who gets taken into detention who is a woman and wears a bra usually has those has the bra their bras taken away from them the minute they're taken into detention and especially when they're placed in segregation so it was not only the hypocrisy but it was the um, the ridiculousness of them actually hyper responsibilizing Jeanette in this case for you know somehow being you know being responsible for what the responses of male staff might be to her and I was appalled then. Um, I don't have to tell you, as we've seen just in the past really week, the Me Too campaigns and um, just the prevalence of, of the responsibilizing of women for their own protection that is, is endemic in our society. But I was really appalled just a few weeks ago. I hosted a group of young people, young girls, actually. It was the, the October 4th was the day of the girl child. And Lest you think your work is getting old, you don't know, you don't think that, but in case anybody else does, uh, Jeanette, it's not. And it's really important that your work continues and that the work that OCLA is, is highlighting your work and highlighting your contributions. Because I was absolutely appalled, this group of young women who were from high schools in this area who came to the Senate chamber and we talked about issues for um, young girls, and the number one question they had, the first thing on their agenda, and every single one of them then joined in, was the dress codes that are in place for young, for only girls in high school, not boys. And they're told actually, and a teacher who was there confirmed, that they're told that they have to dress a certain way because otherwise it might provoke the, their male, the male students or the male teachers. And I was horrified. I, you know, it was, those were the kinds of things I was told when I was in high school, but that's a long, 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 or as my daughter would say, ancient times, prehistoric times. But the reality is the fact that we are still hyper-responsibilizing individuals to not only, and women and girls, to not only protect themselves, but as you know, Jeanette, the minute you do act to do something to protect yourselves or to voice your opinion, the full weight of the law often comes down on those young women, and that's why we see the fastest growing prison population in this country is women and girls. It's not accidental, but it's also not because that who poses the greatest risk to public safety is very much a function of the way we marginalize and uh, victimize those who 
are you know, least able to protect themselves. So there are you know, many, many examples of the ways in which Jeanette has contributed to law reform most recently, and congratulations on the, um, your win just this, it was only two days ago, right? Was it? Yeah. Three, two days ago, right? I know I'm not. I'm trying not to talk about things that I think you might talk about, <laughs> but the many, many examples of the way that you have persevered even in the face of seemingly mountains of everything from police to lawyers to judges to and some of the people who should be allied with you in in these fights. And so, I think it's very appropriate that you just won at the Ontario Court of Appeal, and I think that. Um, the, you will continue your incredibly dedicated um, advocacy, your brilliant artistry, and I, as many of you know, I have a piece of Jeanette's artwork hanging. It was the first piece of artwork we put up in um, my new office, and I'm very proud of that. And it's yeah, everybody sees it, it goes by, everybody comments, and so I hope some of them have bought some of your artwork because I direct <laughs> them to your, uh, your website. And it is, you know, beyond an honor for me to be someone who you asked to join you tonight, not just to witness you, but getting this award, but also to be part of the process. So thank you very much for that. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce to all of you, if, I'm, well, I'm sure you all know who Jeanette is, uh, Jeanette Desinian, who is the 2017 OCLA Civil Liberties Award recipient. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments. July 5th, I got back today from court after a three-day trial. I was found guilty. I defended myself, and as far as I'm concerned, I did an excellent job. There is absolutely no evidence against me, so the, the judge convicted me because I was calm when I was arrested, and therefore it shows that I'm guilty. I bet if I was crying, I would have been labeled mentally insane or convicted and convicted for that as well. I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. I'm going to track down a real lawyer, a Toronto one, and appeal. I've been here since February 15th at Vanya Center for Women in Milton. It's time I start writing my shit down. Hi, I'm Jeanette Asunian, and for a couple of years, I was known as number 10061004 and I'm happy that I don't memorize it anymore and that I have to look at a paper to know this number. So um, <laughs> I'd like to start off by um, thanking the wonderful uh, Kim Pate for introducing me. She is so awesome. Um, before I met her, I was in the jail watching her on TV advocating for <laughs> women in prison. So, um, and then I ended up with a letter from her from jail and we contacted each other afterwards and it's just a wonderful person. And I'd like to thank um, Dennis Rand and Joseph Hickey and the rest of the um, Ontario Civil Liberties staff for um, awarding me, or volunteers, I guess, for um, awarding me tonight. So um, basically, I'll tell you my story, because that's uh, what, it, what I am. I'm, I'm a pretty casual person. Um, if anybody at any point has any questions or comments for me, um, or want to spark a dis discussion in the middle of my speech, go ahead, I don't mind, because um, I've been in audiences before, so I know what that's like. Um, so, um, I'm so happy to receive this award. I, I've, I've been um, working as an activist for years, not actually intentionally at all. I'm just a person who follows my heart and follows what I believe in, and uh, for some reason that seems to piss people off and I also have to defend myself. But uh, apparently I'm a criminal even though I've never actually been a criminal type of person, but uh, people don't like me and that makes me a criminal. People don't like strong women. That, that's basically it. If I find out an independent strong woman, it's something that people just don't like. Or they absolutely love. But <laughs> one or the other. So um, I'll, uh, I'll introduce myself um, and my life. We'll start off with when I was a kid, because that's a perfect time to start off. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't really have much of a voice. I was the youngest of the family from an over-dominating family. I was pretty much bullied by my family. 
Um, but I developed a voice through my art and my writing. And I did that at a very young age. When I was in kindergarten, I did a perfect round sun. That was awesome. Um, and that's when I decided oh, I am an art, that art wasn't just drawing. That's when I took it seriously. So um, later on in college, I found out the reason why I did a perfect circle was because I was following the square of the page and they actually teach you in college to put an X in the middle and make a perfect circle that way but for some reason I visually did that when I was five years old so um, <laughs> so that's pretty cool um, also in kindergarten as I was expressing myself I, I do remember getting in trouble by the teacher and questioning why am I getting in trouble by my kindergarten teacher and because uh, I didn't think I was really in trouble for anything. And I go home and I tell my mom, and, and I'm expecting my mom to go, oh, that's unfair. But instead she goes, oh, well, if the teacher's mad at you, buy her a rose and bring it next to her in the day and, and ask for her forgiveness. So I do what my mom tells me to do. But the whole time I'm feeling like, I think I'm the one that needs to be apologized to. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm too young at the time. So, like, you know, I, I didn't say anything, right? And then... When I'm, I don't know, maybe six, seven years old, uh, yeah, I'm running around topless with the, my best friend next door who's about the same age as me, and we're in the front yard, and our, our older brothers are, you know, in the summertime running around topless too, and, and uh, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden my mom comes out and I go, oh, it's, I think it's about time you start wearing a shirt. <laughs> and I remember getting so mad at my mom and pointing out, well, my brother Mark is going around without a shirt. Why do I have to all of a sudden put on a top? It, it just never made any sense to me. And, and then, oh my God, when I end up being like 12, 13, and you know, you go through that thing where the breasts and the bras and stuff start coming through with puberty, I, then you get teased and everything, and I went to wear a bra, and those things were the most uncomfortable things, and I actually started questioning, why am I actually wearing this? Like, you know, I get, I, I'm small-breasted, I don't need this, <laughs> maybe when I'm jogging or something, but like, I really don't need this, and it's really uncomfortable, and it's making me feel actually horrible, so why should I even be wearing this thing? So, I don't know, sometime around 14, 15 years old, I'm like, screw this bra thing, I'm not even going to bother. And I went to a Catholic high school, so I wore the white blouse, but I usually wore like black t-shirts underneath, like concert t-shirts, or I was involved in the arts and we all got like t-shirts for like drama plays I was in and stuff, so I usually wear those, which is cool. Um, so while I was in high school, um, that's when Gwen Jacobs went um, and, and Guelph and took off her top, which ended up um, causing the whole uh, top freedom controversy in Canada. She uh, eventually overturned the laws. By the time the, all the court stuff happened, I was already out of high school. Now, when I was in high school and I saw all the women going and protesting, I wanted to go do that. But I also wanted to be a good girl because I still live with my parents who are, you know, fairly conservative Catholic type people that were immigrants in the old, old world and the whole bit. So I, I, I waited until, you know, I, my, my freedom of expression didn't actually happen until I left the house. So um, I lived a year in Vancouver when I first uh, left high school and uh, that was a lot of fun because I ended up living, well, besides panhandling on the street for money because I had no idea what I was doing and it was a few credit shorts for my high school diploma and everybody from Ontario was moving to BC to, because the welfare rates was better over there and Harris just came in over here. But, uh, uh, so I couldn't get a job. But um, anyways, uh, so I come back and I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I go to finish high school, I take an entrepreneur course. Turns out, you know, I take all these tests and I'm the perfect entrepreneur. Of course, I was selling my art since I had like recess in school and stuff like that, right? So, um, uh, so I, 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 my parents never gave me an, an allowance, so if I wanted to catch up with my friends, I had to make my own money. Um, so anyways, I'm out of school, and I would like to get into university, because that's actually where I was headed. I was an all-advanced student in school, but I can't get into university because I, you know, my mom kicked me out of the house in a big fight and a few credits short. So um, all of a sudden, there's this thing going on, and um, the, the, the top freedom thing happened. Uh, the laws got overturned. Gwen Jacobs win. And these, um, these towns in Ontario, and one of them being the city of Cambridge, decided they're above the provincial law. And they're going to put in some little tiny bylaws saying, oh, no, we can't have topless women in our city. 
you know, you know, presuming because the media likes to go, oh, topless women, breasts, you know, it's all about showing breasts and women, you know, exposing their breasts sexually to turn on men and hearing all this stuff is like, uh, no, there's a law that says that men have the choice whether they want to keep their top on or off, but women don't have that same choice. And most women I know rather keep their top on, but they would rather have the choice as a man, the same choice when to have it and not be forced that you have to keep it on. And you know, it's it's it was horrible because I was arguing that for years and I'm like, people are not getting it. All they see is boobies, boobies, and I'm like go crazy, and that's exactly what people do, right? So yeah. <laughs> so anyways, um, um, I, I, the city of Cambridge, uh, they decided to put it on a bylaw. Oh, a lady who was, I was, what, 22 at the time, and a lady in her mid-30s, she decided, I'm going to challenge this. She swam in a pool, and um, I think they threw, threw it out so she couldn't actually challenge it. So there was all these controversies around, and there's city hall. And um, I, I had a boyfriend at the time, and uh, he was... Uh, he was also in his mid-30s, much older than me, and he liked being around a young lady. I used to also model at the time, so I was a very uh, attractive young lady. And um, so he was all like, oh, yeah, there's something going on at City Hall in Kitchener. Uh, it's going to be a whole, you know, uh, forum about the whole top freedom thing. And I know that you're, like, been interested in that. Well, let's go to it, you know? Like, I, I wasn't aware uh, uh, how my uh, boyfriend was exploiting me at the time, but <laughs> uh, I think that he had that in he his head because I didn't think he actually thought that I would actually get up and speak at this thing. Um, so um, I'm go I go to this thing. The place is packed. This is Kitchener City Hall. Completely friggin' packed. And there's these people up, and they're talking about women's breasts are for their husbands. <laughs> and I'm going, what? And I just started, I actually said out loud, what? <laughs> you know, and I just started going, and I'm like in the back, they're like, oh, if you want to make comments, you have to line up in the podium when it's time. And I'm screwing up, they just talk and whatnot. Next thing you know, I'm being yelled at. The thing's over. I'm getting followed out by a whole bunch of people yelling at me. The city hall guards are coming to make sure, you know, I'm escorted out properly. There's the media all over me. I'm getting calls from the media. I've never done anything to this before in my life. It's like, wow, okay, this is pretty crazy. But, um, and the lady in Cambridge, she gives me a call. She's all like, oh, I'm going to go challenge this again. Why don't you come with me? I'm like, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, and then there's my poor boyfriend going, oh my god, I didn't expect this. <laughs> but I just thought she'd get excited and show her breasts to my friends or something. But like, uh, so I ended up going, no, I'm right in on this. And, um, and I, so I go for the swim. I go for a swim in Cambridge in a pool with, you know, my top off. And there's children around and whatnot. And um, we get arrested, which, you know, was the plan, get arrested, get the charge, challenge the law, right? So we get arrested on a summer day, and all I got is a pair of shorts, and they don't have us change it back in the room, so they bring it outside in the parking lot, and I remember, the, you know, my bare feet and the hot cement and sitting there out there while they're trying to figure out what to do, and they end up charging us. And then um, no court really wanted to hear this, so the city of Cambridge decided they'll They'll hire a private prosecutor to try to try us in a private court. <laughs> and this is happening in this little town. And the, the, the woman I swam with, she was all like, she was the one who was really the, the head of this. I was just following along at the time. Um, um, Fatima Pereira Henson and from Cambridge. And so she, um, she ended up, um, was it? Uh, Chrissy Blanchford or Rosie DeMann, I can't remember one of the popular reporters. She who worked for the Star at the time, but I think works for the Post now, and uh, called her up and she brought the attention to Toronto. As soon as the guy hit Toronto in the big papers, uh, the city decided, no, we're going to squash our bylaw. <laughs> so we ended up winning, which is cool. So that was my first thing. So now I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm this girl in Kitchener, and I just did some activism stuff. And uh, my boyfriend, who ended up leaving, also managed a head shop. So I hung out with him, and um, God, I, I, um, I was smoking marijuana at the time because I'm what young Canadian doesn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so 
uh, you know, hanging out with all the hippie people, and here I am smoking weed. And at the same time, you know, I'm going to my dealer's place, and there's like people with wheelchairs and stuff, you know, going to the same dealer I'm going to, and I'm hearing their stories about medical marijuana and legalizing it, and I'm all like, hell yeah, it should be illegal, you know, there's the one place in, um, in um, Vancouver that was uh, ran by Hillary Black, and uh, she was the first one that started a medical center in Canada. So I'm all like, this is totally cool. I want to start one, and there's a few other people in Toronto that wanted to start one, or, or in Ontario, in different cities that wanted to start one. So um, I go to Vancouver a few times. I hang out with Hillary Black and her plays. I hang out with Mark Emery, who everybody, I think, knows. <laughs> and um, I come back, and we start forming something with um, the lawyer, Alan Young, who actually represented um, one of your, uh, <laughs> uh, the dominatrix there. So yeah, yeah, which is pretty awesome. A lot of my friends are dominatrixes, so I was really in on that case. So same lawyer. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so he represented us, but I didn't end up getting busted for anything. So I opened up one of Canada's four medical marijuana centers um, in Canada, the, one of the first four. You know, like so There was the one in um, Vancouver, and then three opened up. So one in Toronto, one in London, and then me in Kitchener. So I'm giving... Um, I'm, I'm actually making forms. I'm doing all my research. I'm... Uh, most of the research came from Australia and the U.S. when it came to medical marijuana. So I did all that, and I'm coming up with all the doctor's forms and everything, and I'm getting people to, who came, you know, wanting medical marijuana to f bring the forms to their doctors, and they come back, and I'd actually go, and I called the office, and the secretaries would be laughing because they're like, we can't believe our... You know, doctor actually signed these forms, and the doctors had no problem signing forms. This was 20 years ago, no problem. And... Uh, so then I tried to, you know, you know, give the people their marijuana. Um, but because it was so new, um, no actual supplier really wanted to be associated with me uh, because they didn't want to get vested, you know. So I had to often go, and this is Ontario, so I had to go to BC a lot to go pick up my weed, unfortunately, or get it uh, shipped in the mail by the more outspoken activists out there. The Toronto Club get bust, got busted, the London Club got busted, but I still existed because I was not selling it to people who weren't medical. <laughs> so, um, and, and I was really strict in how I did it. But I, I found it interesting because I started talking to the government and I realized the rest of the medical marijuana activists, when it came to the government, were going, screw you, assholes. You know, they'd be writing politicians, telling them off about how much they hate them. And I'm like, I don't think this is going to get through to people really well. So <laughs> I started, you know, contacting, you know, um, well, there was um, the health minister and the justice minister at the time. One was one, one was the other. It was Anne McLennan and um, Alan Rock, and then they switched places. But it, it's the two departments that you had to fight medical marijuana with, so it didn't make a difference. And so I was contacting their department all the time, and they started getting back to me. And, the, and I'm giving them all, they're like, oh, well, we don't have any information on medical marijuana. So I started giving them all the information I gathered, mostly from the States and Australia and other places around the world. And um, uh, one day I get a call, and uh, there and there's only two medical marijuana places left because I busted the other two. So I get a call, and they're from Health Canada. And I remember sitting on my desk, smoking a joint, naked, and getting a call from Health Canada, and I'm thinking, should I be in a suit or something? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is all new to me back then. Now I do this all the time, but you know, this is all this new to me back then. So. six months or so, so I actually got to find out ahead of everybody else, the, the publicly, that they were going to legalize it, and they called me up, so I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Now, I was young, so was I thinking about, oh, okay, I'll profit off of all this marijuana one day? No. <laughs> I was just, I saw the sick people, and I wanted to help the sick people, and I was going to their house, like, the articles were written about me, comparing me to Florence Nightingale, and I'm like, who's this, that person? I had to research her, and, <laughs> you know, I'm like, because I was actually going to 
people's houses and, and caring for them. I was, uh, you know, looking at their doses. I was, you know, like uh, one lady, I, I, I got her, um, she was getting um, morphine delivered to her by the RCMP, like boxes full as she was bedridden. And um, she ended up, uh, after me feeding her specific strains and stuff for a while, she ended up cutting her uh, morphine in half and was able to get in a wheelchair and go shopping and stuff like that. So she became more part of life. Um, but anyways, uh, at this point, people wanted me to run for city council in Kitchener, and, and I'm young, and I'm thinking, you know what, I'll probably just end up being a puppet for somebody for a year or two, and then probably get squashed out, and maybe I'd like to run for politics someday, but now is not the time. I still had that, I want to go to university thing in my head. So um, I ended up getting accepted to Niagara College. So I moved from the Kitchener-Waterloo area to Niagara College. See, I wrote all these notes, and I'm not even looking at them. <laughs> and um, I should have done it on a tablet, like him. <laughs> I don't know, I'm an artist, paper is just I, stuff I need to feel things, so that's my deal. I try computer stuff, but computer's more of a promo thing for me. So anyways, um, I go to Niagara College, and um, I ended up solving the weed problem that my club ended up having. So I didn't leave my patients stranded, even though I think that said it in the papers. I actually <laughs> did leave people in charge of giving my patients their weed, and uh, they didn't want to be public about it. So it's just, you know, end of the medical marijuana club. And um, then I started growing marijuana to get through college because my parents wouldn't sign the student loan applications because they're assholes, and I had to pay for it. And so I was like, okay. So I grew the weed and I sent it to Kitchener to feed the club um, their medication and um, smoke a lot of weed while I'm studying art at college. So, um, anyways, I um, graduated from college after two years, started university. Um, but some weird things, let's see. Let me go to my notes at this point. Yeah. So, I'm near the end of my college year. I have about one month left and I'm part-time taking university. Um, I'm taking art in college. Uh, I took some writing courses, but in university I started taking writing and Canadian politics and I was thinking about getting into law. So, um, I ended up um, smashing my car um, that I was leasing and I already paid half of it for it with a ridiculous rate um, and the car company went to sue me because I still owed the lease and all this crap. So then I'm all like, well, I'll go out and get a lawyer. You know, like, hey, I was this awesome activist in like Niagara. You know, I might have spent two years in college just kind of, you know, not in the public and studying and completely absorbed in art. But, you know, lawyers are awesome and they just like snap you up and help you. Well, I found out that when you're in the public eye, Lawyers treat you different than if you're a nobody. So now I'm a nobody. Nobody knows me. I'm in Niagara. So who the hell am I? So I'm, I'm going, hey, lawyers, can you help me out with this um, litigation problem I'm having? No, 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 no. Go find somebody else. No, 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 no. no. All it is no. And I have no idea how I'm supposed to deal with this in court. So one of my college friends is like, oh, I know a lawyer. He helped me um, when I was in high school. and. My dad kicked me out of the house, but wouldn't sign the papers for me to go on um, OW or whatever, so he helped me out, so go with him. So I call this lawyer up, and I'm all like, oh, a friend of mine recommended you. Oh, a friend, oh yeah, who is that? Oh, Heather, okay, cool, come on over, you can come. So I come over to this place, and he looks at everything, and he's all like, no, nope, the only way you're gonna get out of this is if you go bankrupt. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, oh yeah, you're, you, do you have any money to pay for this? And I'm like, oh, it's like 10 grand or whatever. And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, then you're going to end up going to jail. So if you don't want to go to jail, which is the only thing that's going to happen to you, then you have to go bankrupt. And I'm like, but this doesn't sound right. You know, like after talking to lawyers, ever being refused, then I'm like, going, well, well, I don't know, something doesn't sound right about it, but, and, and I'm like going, but what about my university? Like, this will affect my student loan and stuff like that, and I'd like to go on to university, actually. I was planning on studying law, and, and you're a lawyer. This, something doesn't seem right about this. And he's like, no, you're going to jail. Like, if you're going to go and fight this, you're going to go to jail. 
And he's all like, it doesn't matter because bankruptcy is completely different than it used to be. Within a year, you'll have all your credit cards back and I had perfect credit. Um, and you'll be able to go back to university. So I'm like, okay. He's like, that's all you have to do. Sit around for a year and you, you'll go back. And I'm like, okay, well, if that's the case, then let's do it. So that turned out to be a complete, utter friggin' lie. But when I discovered that was my first uh, thing, uh, he's decided, well, you know, I'm a lawyer and, you know, I could help you out and all this stuff. And you seem like a pretty nice lady and you want to go to a movie and whatnot. And, well, he was kind of good looking, and I was young and sexual at the time, and up for pretty much anything. So I'm like, okay, fine, you helped me out, you know. Like, I, I look back at my young age, and I was like, so smart but so dumb at the same time. <laughs> and, and it's like, um, it's kind of weird because uh, one of the first things this guy asked me when I went into this office is like, where's your parents? And I'm like, I don't have any parents. I'm doing this all on my own. At this point, I think I cut my parents off totally. Um, and he's asking me personal questions about myself. Um, it's interesting because I'm all like, okay, well now that I've gone bankrupt, I'm also losing my home here, my apartment. Like, and he's all like, well, move in with me. He takes all my stuff, I put it in his place, but he doesn't give me the key to his house. And I'm like, well, this is kind of fucked up. He's talking a good game, but his actions are kind of weird what's going on and then he's all like oh yeah let's go visit a friend of mine and stay so apparently before he was a lawyer he was in his like I think he became a lawyer in his 40s he was a border guard and he's originally from Connecticut and um so he's like we're gonna go visit my friend in the States so I go with him to go across the border. We're in Niagara, so across the border is just going across town. <laughs> it's, it's, that's all it is, just across the river, like here to Hall, you know, same thing. So, um, so he um, ends up bringing me across the border. Instead of going to the actual way you're supposed to go, he goes the side way because he used to work for Border Patrol, so his friends all work there. So he goes in, says hi to his buddy, who looks at me but doesn't look at me and waves us through and we keep going. So I just went across the border with no record of me going across the border. Later I find out that's how they traffic prostitutes. So anyways, I go across the border and he ends up, we stop at some place, he ends up going to the washroom. This is like 20 years ago, so I can't remember if I had a cell phone or if I had to call a friend from a payphone. But I called my, a friend of mine up at, who was also an older male, because that's all, when you're an attractive young woman, that's all you get around you is old guys like, surrounding you. It's almost impossible to do anything without that. Anyways, uh, so, um, it's the truth. <laughs> that's why everybody's laughing. So, um, anyways, um, uh, I call my friend up, and he's all like, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm across the border, and I just got, he's like, you should probably come back. I think there's something wrong here, right? Anyways, the lawyer dude comes out, and he sees that I'm on the phone, and then he starts getting mad. I get off the phone, and he's like, what'd you do? And it's like, I told, I told my friend that I was here because I wanted to you know, oh, you ruined everything. That's it. We're going back. And, he's, and we go back across the border. So I go to my friend, my friend's all like, you gotta get your stuff out of this guy's house. And I'm like, yeah, do fucking shit. So I go with my friend to, we grab a U-Haul, we go to grab my stuff out of the house. He already moved my stuff, like, cause you know, for a couple of days he wouldn't give me the keys and my cats were in there too. <laughs> and, um, um, when I go to get my stuff, he's already having my stuff in separate boxes and, and, and kind of sorted it out. And I'm trying to find my stuff and I'm trying to find my stuff amongst other women's clothes. And it's like, uh, where are these other women and why didn't they come back to pick up their stuff? You know, like, this is where things started getting, this is a defense lawyer in the uh, St. Catherine's Courthouse. So, um, that was an experience which kind of just wrote this dude off and kind of just kept moving on. So I ended up going, what do I do with my life? Um, I, Guess I can't go back to university, <laughs> which is really what I wanted to do because all my life that's where my head's been. Like, I gotta go to university. 
So, um, yeah, I gotta make something out of myself. I gotta be like I was, you know, overachieving kind of woman, right? And I was, I was getting awards, like the award I'm getting here. You know, I used to have like a stack of these things, right? <laughs> and, and, and they all were that they had stains on them. <laughs> important to anybody. I really, really didn't have any family. When I would go to get these awards and there'd be other people lined up, like these youth awards and stuff, there'd be their families there. I'd just go there, grab this stuff and take a cab home or something. Because it's like, nobody's there patting me on the back or nothing. So it really was meaningless. And and oh, later I found out people use these things to get jobs and stuff. But if but the type of jobs that you get with all these awards, you also have to have a university degree. So it's like these things are useless to me. But tonight I'm actually the <laughs> This is a word, right? This is different. Because <laughs> I deserve this one for sure. <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyways, I'm all like, screw this, I'll open up an art gallery. And I, I've already been hanging around artists. Actually, because of the activism I did um, in my youth, um, in my extreme youth, it matured me way above everybody else. So I cannot relate to people my age in my early 20s. Like, you know, before I did all that activism, I was like everybody else going to bars and hanging out and having fun, but you couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> it brought me to a complete level. And I found myself in Niagara on the Lake associating with old, rich, successful people for some reason. And they all wanted to show me, you know, how to make it in life. And I'm like, this is cool because they thought that they're. They were too soft on their kids, and, and they were spoiling their kids, and they see that I'm working hard. So they actually wanted to show me things. So I hung around a whole bunch of rich artists, and um, they actually were the first people, first artists in my gallery, my very first gallery. So um, so it was cool having all these successful old rich people and have, have me tr trusted with their art and stuff, <laughs> especially since you know a few years earlier I was you know hanging around in Vancouver panhandling on the streets and stuff. So that was pretty honorable. So I opened up downtown St. Catharines, my first art gallery. And you know, doing what I always do, go with the flow, follow my heart, you know, do what I believe in. And it turns out to be great. Tons of people come in, you know, and, and it's awesome, but right away it was a little slow. But word starts getting around that this uh, person has a really awesome art collection somewhere. Because I have an eye for art and I know what's, you know, sellable, what's real. What, there's, you know, tons of art out there, but what belongs in the gallery and can sell is another thing. And I was able to recognize that. And so buyers would started getting to know there's a person, like serious art collectors, that has a serious art collection. And next thing you know, people are coming down from Toronto and Buffalo, you know, parking their Jaguars in front of my place, and I, I think I had a beater car or something at the time. <laughs> and they're actually like making these large purchases of art. I'm like, oh yes, it's working, this is awesome. But I wasn't thinking that there might be an actual established art <laughs> you know, society that I might be pissing off that might want, you know, be threatened that I might be getting in the way of their government grants because, you know, when, you know, stuff like the Ontario Arts Council and the Canada Arts Council grant stuff is usually to Toronto or big cities and rarely does it see the smaller cities and if it does, it's only one recipient. So um, I started getting a lot of hate from some of the local people there, and um, that didn't help very much. Um, I ended up getting involved in local politics, because when you owned a, um, a business in a downtown, you're going to start being part of the Downtown Business Association and getting involved in you know, the politics and business, because business and politics go together. And, and these are things that have kind of been in my life all my life. I, um, I'm not going to go back to my childhood story, but it, it's been interest since uh, you know, childhood, and I was always following politics really closely and getting heated, uh, uh, you know, debates when I was in school and elementary school and stuff. So, um, so I ended up uh, getting involved in that, and I go to a town hall meeting. So I go to this town hall meeting, and it's all about the improvement of downtown St. Catharines, and um, you know, let's you know make something of this place. So I go there, and all I see are the same people from city hall in the suits going blah 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 blah. And you know, everything that they're saying is completely meaningless, and nothing's going to happen, right? So uh, then they open it up to the end, and anybody who wants to speak, I grab the mic, <laughs> and I'm all like, "This is a bunch of bullshit." All you've been hearing from 
from everybody is a bunch of bullshit. Now, my audience is, um, is like uh, the Market Square downtown St. Catharines, and it's completely packed mostly with the local politicians and business people. And I'm going, this is bullshit, all of this is bullshit. I, I can't remember the specifics, but I'm like, this is the way it should be, this is the way it should be. Yeah. And if anybody knows me, I'm a dictator. <laughs> Leading when I ran for politics, I actually said that in a debate. I am a dictator. Oh. <laughs> um, but so, like, and what happened after everybody just went clap, clap, clap after everybody else's speech? After my speech, people rose out of their seats and I had the whole audience clapping for me. It was like, oh, wow. And like this new reporter from uh, uh, the local paper who just was uh, in, who was from Ottawa, actually, he runs up to me and he goes, I haven't heard anybody speak like this here in St. Catharines at all, in Ottawa all the time, and not in St. Catharines. Like, um, you know, in this little conservative, it's, it's a big town, but they act like a little hick town. And so, um, you know, he goes to interview me, right? And I give him this huge interview, and he's like, okay, cool, now I have to go interview the other people. But, oh, man, I, I'm going to make this story about you. And there was also the Code to Code TV. So later on, I'm watching Code to Code TV. I'm the last person. They cut, cut it off right before my speech. So I'm not in there. So next day, I'm not in the paper. I call the reporter, and I'm all like, hey, I wasn't in the paper. What's, uh, I thought you were going to write about me. And he's all like, uh, da, da. and he's saying a few things. And then he ends up whispering in the phone, going, my editor said I had to cut you out. <laughs> So I was purposely cut out from the media. Uh, the funny thing earlier, um, um, was it? Yeah, it did happen earlier. Right before I opened up my art gallery, see if I went through my notes, I would have actually been in order with my stories. <laughs> That's the only reason why I write notes, is just to be in order, because I already have my speech in my head. But um, anyways, a little earlier, um, between the lawyer and the uh, opening up of my art gallery, I did come across some of the St. Catherine Standard people. And um, I went to a Canadian Authors Association, every town has them, uh, meeting because I like to write. And um, he's all like, oh, you should write a, you know, we do personal essays and, you know, we publish them on our, our voices, the local stuff. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, but it turns out they all knew about me being the topless marijuana chick. So, um, they're all like, so you like, you know, the freedom of expression and nudism. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I hung around a nude beach in Vancouver and stuff like that. People do what they want. Oh, is there anything around here? And I'm like, actually, there's a, you know, a little park in Niagara on the lake where there's a little section of beach where, you know, people end up getting naked or whatnot. Oh, would you do an official, like, nude beach there? And I'm like, well, I don't see why not. You want to do an article about it? And I'm like, oh, this is totally cool, right? Because I'm used to media people and stuff like this. So I meet them at the beach. Turns out they were just the photographer and the writer and everybody was just there to get naked pictures of me. All they wanted was naked pictures of me. And then afterwards, they got, ended up degrading me, saying, ho, 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 ha, 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 you thought you were actually going to write in our paper. And I'm like, going, this is the, like, this is what Sun Media at the time posted me. I can't remember which one, but no, actually, I think it was Osprey at the time is what they were under. But anyways, so I'm like, wow, after being in Kitchener, you know, being completely respected by the media, being respected by lawyers, and being respected by politicians. I go to Niagara, and I'm getting lawyers trying to traffic me across the border. I, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm having the media bait me into naked pictures, and I'm like, I'm like, what the, what the hell is going? This is like a different town altogether. Well, when I first moved there, um, it wasn't that long after the whole Paul, Paul Bernardo case and stuff like that. And when I moved there, all I would hear is, you know, Paul and Carla, they weren't the only ones, they were part of a ring, all the locals know this, you know, like, that's all I would hear from the locals, you don't hear this publicly. If you're in Niagara, you hear this shit all the time. So, um, so it, you know, and I'm, I just moved there, I'm all like, yeah, whatever, whatever, I'm here for college, I'm here for two years and leave, but that's, but people were talking about, you know, how it's a major problem in that area and those were the two that got caught. So, uh, because I stepped out of line and didn't just take the marginalized women, but started going after the high school students. So, um, um, so there is a bigger problem in Niagara. I do know that. But when I was told that earlier, you know, when I first moved there, I wasn't even thinking about it. Um, so, anyways, I have my 
art gallery. Um, I'm not allowed to be in the media, but of course the media not too long before that were treating me like crap. So, um, so I have my art gallery, and um, there is a landlord across the street, another old man, and. I live in the back of my art gallery, and he's all like, well, I own the building. Um, he also he owned it with another guy who is known as a slumlord, and another local lawyer who turns out to be friends with that other lawyer that I ran in earlier, um, but I didn't know that at the time. Anyways, you know, he's all like, hey, move into my place. Uh, and I'm like, I can't afford it. I want to make more money here before I get an apartment. He's all like, I won't charge you last month's rent, and you can have the small little batch, and I'll give it to you cheap, because I'm a business owner, and I want to help out another business owner. Uh, yeah, the apartment he gave me, the bathroom also was where the roof was. So if he stands on the roof and looks in my window while I'm taking a shower, <laughs> Um, it was very convenient for him. So he was knocking on my own door all the time, started offering me free rent for sex services, and I'm like, uh, no way. Um, but right before he did that, he did give me a few marijuana plants, and I did end up um, putting them under a few lights in there, um, which were being grown in the basement, and the basement's hydro, as I saw the mail, was in the lawyer's name. So, um, so he gives me a few plants. And when I refuse to sleep with him, what does he do? He calls the cops. <laughs> so the fire department gets there first. And um, they go, you know what, before the cops are here, we're going to remove your equipment. And they decided to remove my equipment and put it in my store for me. And then also give me a speech on how to properly have a hydroponics set up. That was uh, fire safety. So, you know, make sure the ballast is on concrete or glass, but not on wood. Or, you know, like, and, you know I'm like, oh, okay, this is cool. So they bring my equipment over. So by the time the cops come there, I'm like, hey, firemen. <laughs> by the time I got up in there, all I did was take my plants and put them in a bag and leave and not even charge me. But I'm sitting there going, yeah, I'm a medical marijuana activist. I'm a marijuana activist. And I'll get it for recreational reasons. So if you want to charge me, you know, go ahead, and I'll see you in court for years, and I'll challenge this. And blah. So they didn't charge me. They just took my plans. Right? It's like, OK, that's great. I, um, apparently, somebody at some point tells me I have, oh, I'm being evicted. And I'm like, oh, that's funny. I didn't get an evicted notice. So I decided to call um, the tenant and landlord people, but not in Niagara. I called the Toronto one, because I know Niagara. At this point, I realized that there's a little corrupt uh, circle going on with all the uh, public servants and stuff around there. So I called the Toronto one, and they looked up, and they're like, oh, yeah, no, didn't the bailiff, or what, what's it called, the, uh, whatever that comes to the uh, door, the city cop guy, and uh, gives you the notice for eviction. And I'm like, no, I didn't get one at all. <laughs> so I called them up, and I'm like, hey, apparently you guys want to give me a notice, but you didn't actually give it to me. So if you're going to give it to me, give it to me. So they did come to my door, you know, like a, a couple of weeks later, head bowed, kind of <laughs> sheepishly <laughs> giving me the actual paperwork. Uh, by that time, I already moved out, but I kind of, um, you know, held them uh, for two, three months. You know? <laughs> I'm like, screw this. If you're not going to make any money off of this place. Or if you're, you know, I don't know how to challenge it, but I'm like, screw this. And um, what ended up happening, uh, everybody, when I did that speech, told me to run for city council. So I put on my name of list for city council, because there was an election at the time. But I wasn't even doing anything. I wasn't campaigning. I was doing nothing. And um, these people, the, the, the landlord who had just screwed around, I had a volunteer in my art gallery, and he convinces the volunteer that the volunteer should help him move all my paintings and everything into his store, because people are going to come after me and rob me and take it. So to this day, that volunteer actually thinks he was doing me a favor by um, helping to save my art, which what he was doing was helping robbing my art gallery. So. Um, my art gallery gets robbed. Um, I call the police. The police say, you know, after the whole me going, oh, I'll take you for a minute to get me with the marijuana, they're all like, so, uh, you know, so we'll do the information for your insurance. And I'm like, I don't have any insurance. 
And they're like, well, then what do you want us to do? And I'm like, well, why don't you go after the people who robbed my stuff? I could tell you who did it and where it's at right now. And it's like, uh, no, we're not going to do that. And they didn't. And I'm sitting there going, wow, this is brutal. My whole art gallery got robbed. But I did manage, um, because I did have a heads up before that happened, to get a lot of my artists' artwork out of there. So I only had my artwork in there. So it was actually my artwork that got robbed. The funny thing is, the person who gave me the heads up, I didn't realize at the time, was actually hanging out with the buddy who originally robbed me. And the reason why he knew it was happening was because he was part of it. So when he ended up taking my um, artwork of my other artists, he opened up his own gallery <laughs> and used the artists in there, which most of the artists go, who the fuck is this guy? I don't know who he is. And he's like, because they're smart, rich people who I have. They're, they're going, Jeanette, you got caught up in something. I don't know what, I'm taking my art away from this dude. <laughs> it was horrible. Dude was also the dude that sold me all my, metal, or all my marijuana growing equipment because he, grew, he worked at the, uh, actually his fa local family owned the place that supplied all the uh, marijuana growing equipment in the Niagara region. So um, I knew who this dude was. And it turns out the whole entire time I was in college, going to his place to pick up um, marijuana growing equipment, I was telling him all about art and art galleries. So when I opened up the art gallery, he, he, I remember him saying, oh, that would be a perfect front to wash marijuana through. And I'm like, yeah, I'm growing marijuana, and yeah, I'm an artist, but I actually want a real art gallery, really sell art. That's, that's the thing. Well, it turns out he got the idea that he could open up an art gallery and start washing marijuana through his, and he needed artists and artwork to show in order to make it look legitimate. So <laughs> this guy became my enemy for many, many years. Um, I didn't want him to be my enemy, but he seemed to want to be my enemy. So, um, so it's unfortunate, because I ended up losing my gallery. And I lose, uh, um, the, uh, because I got robbed. My landlords got really pissed off and wanted to do something about it. Uh, I thought about it, because nobody else was offering me help. But they were also known to be the Italian Mafia. And I'm like, I don't know if I want them to help me. <laughs> I don't think that's going to put me involved in anything further, especially since the, um, the, the landlord that I had uh, problems with across the street also had problems with him, and he was a Mason. Then I would have been sick in the Mafia against the Masons. And I'm like, I don't want to get involved in any of that shit. I would be using it as an excuse is what it would be for their few that's been going on for years. And I didn't want to get involved in that. So I just dropped it. Moved back out in the country, got a little apartment in Queenston. Um, but it turns out, I'm all like, oh, screw this. I'll just reopen up an art gallery somewhere else. But I'm saying that publicly. And um, the, the, the this guy who just opened up his art gallery, he's now got this thing in his head that he wants to take me down all the time. So uh, he sent somebody. Um, oh, I ended up getting my first job, too, at the time as a financial advisor selling life insurance and wearing a suit all the time, which is pretty interesting um, in, in the meantime. And so I ended up um, meeting this guy at a party, but he knew all about me. He was like, you're Jeanette Sunni, and you're the one who ran for city council, and St. Catharines, and owned the art gallery. And of course, that gets to my head. I'm all like, yeah, that's me, right? And he was you know, younger than me, a little younger and cute. And, and whatnot, but um, so we started dating, and then he just ends up, you know, robbing me, beating me, doing all this freaking crap. Um, people later on ended up coming to me and going, you know what, buddy is actually friends with those other buddies over there that's been screwing you around, and we've been hearing them talk. It, th this is an interesting thing that I learned. Evil people, there are people out there who particularly get off on doing bad things and they like it and they know that that's what they're doing. They brag. They cannot do their evil deeds without letting a certain group of people know about it. They don't like to do it, you know. Well, when you brag to a group of people, sometimes those people might be not always on your side and might think that you are doing a bad thing and tell the person that you're doing the bad thing too. So I ended up finding from people who, who, were, who overheard all these conversations that I am being set up. <laughs> these things are happening to me. And um, I had uh, a quarter million dollar life insurance policy at the time on myself. And this guy was trying to put me on his paperwork and um, try to then get me institutionalized in jail. And these, this guy 
was the first one who said, I'm going to knock you up, and when you're pregnant, I'm going to take the baby away from you, I'm going to prove that you're crazy, I'm going to take the baby, and then you're going to have to owe me money because I'm going to raise this baby. And he's saying that to me. And it's kind of funny because for the next several years, I ended up getting several guys come up to me saying very similar things. And it turns out because they all talk. And they all know each other. And they're all saying this to each other. They're, they're saying, hey, this is Jeanette. We have fun. You want to have some fun? Fuck with this person. And this is how you do it. This is how I did this. So this is how you could do that. These are the things that trigger her. She's, you know, she, she's a spark. And you know, she'll start fighting back. And she's a feisty one. And you know, it'll be fun when you're raping her. When she's beat and trying to beat you off. Right? Like, so... I ended up getting a whole series of assholes do this to me. At the same time, I open up another art gallery downtown. Um, 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 Niagara Falls started doing an art thing. All these art people who I've been pissing off and stuff because of I don't know what the hell, they started opening up art galleries and everybody starts opening. I ended up with this guy, the, the main dude of them all, coming in going, I'm going to take you down, I'm going to take you down. So the funny thing is, I ended up somehow on, um, the, my member of parliament at the time was uh, Rob Nicholson, conservative, and he was the minister of justice. Right when he became a minister of justice was the first time I got out of jail for the first fuck up these guys fucked me up with. And um, I, I wrote to Rob Nicholson telling him, Yo, you're the justice minister, you're my member of parliament. Um, uh, you, like this is what's going on in jail and I told him what was going on in jail and uh, they brought me to the office I had a meeting with him and then they appoint me to the local board of directors of the EDA for the conservative party so I joined the conservative party and I was part of the local board of directors for about six months until I get kicked off for my behavior <laughs> which is I was surrounded by these assholes all the time that kept fucking me up, fucking me up, fucking me up, fucking me up until these guys kicked me out is basically what happened. Uh, we can't have you board, on the board of a justice minister when you have all these like assholes hanging on trying to destroy you because they're going to try to destroy us. And here I'm thinking, you know what? I'm a woman by myself, alone, and I'm going through all this shit. And I'm looking at all the people who are actually successful in life. Like I'm going, okay, I worked hard, right? And there are other people who don't have these problems. Why don't they have the, like, I've gone through, you know, like, all the proper steps in the proper way that you're supposed to do. I should be more successful, and I shouldn't have these people around me. Oh, wait a second. All the other people had parents. <laughs> and they had family, and they had friends. And I didn't have any of those. And I was basically... Here I am, this, this person, and it was kind of funny, um, because I ended up reading around the same time to Donald Trump, I don't really care for the dude, but um, or now as president, definitely not, but he had a book, and somebody gave it to me, um, The Art of the Comeback, and it had these ten rules, right? And um, I didn't read the book, but I did read the ten rules, which is the first page. <laughs> so, so I read the first page. How did you feel? No, there he was another, he did two. There was another one called Art of the Comeback. And so um, one of it was be paranoid. You have something and people will want it. And I started actually taking that seriously. Like that, no, I actually, I have an art gallery. <laughs> you know? I, I'm an attractive woman, you know? Like, I, I have things that people want and people are going, if you're in business, you're going to end up with enemies and people trying to fuck you up <laughs> and if you're in politics that's all part of it it's unfortunately but a lot of people are able to go through it because they have the support system behind you actually well I, when i was in jail and i haven't even gotten to that part yet i'm you guys seem to be listening to me so i'm just going on <laughs> um when I was in jail, I actually wrote Conrad Black, and I said, I'm, I'm writing to everybody. I wrote, I wrote Kim, she wrote back to me. So, <laughs> you know, like, I, and, and I'm all like, you were wrongfully convicted, you were a business person, you probably know what this is, you know, like, but here I am in jail because I was alone and, and nobody and I needed some help, and that, I guess it touched him because he actually wrote back to me. <laughs> and so, like, you know, it's like what I wrote to him actually was real and resonated with him. And, and it's kind of funny because uh, 
I, if you're a real person and you say things real, you, you, you get responses from people. Like, I don't know if any of you have ever been on a campaign where, you, uh, where everybody's sending a politician the same letter and the politician receives, like, you know, thousands of the same letter. <laughs> I don't know. I, and they're like, why don't they respond to me? It's like, I don't know. I get the one letter, I talk like a human being and address them as a human being, and they respond right back to me. I don't you know what I'm upset all about. It. I mean, there's one sitting right here. Why? Because I didn't fake things, because I'm honest and I'm real, and so is she. And she, uh, she's one of the very few ones that actually, in all this activism and crap that I've come across, that, that I've found in a position like that, who's actually a real person that goes out and does real things. Things you know, which you know <laughs> makes her a well-deserved in her spot. So <laughs> it's for sure. Um, so I didn't even get to even the jail stuff that I'm even about. So, um, anyways, um, you know what? I'll just go right to it. They take down my Niagara Gallery. I end up getting illegally kicked out. I'm now being chased by the cops. Wherever I'm driving, they're pulling me over, coming up with excuses. I actually, the second time I got pulled over, the cop goes, so what did the first cop get you on? And I'm like this. He's like, OK, then I'll get you on. You know, it's like, oh my god, what the hell is going on? I run for city council at, in Niagara Falls. Not because, at this point, I wasn't even serious about winning. I'm all like, holy shit, there's some shit going on. I got to say some stuff. And there's like, Niagara, Lar or Niagara, uh, um, Niagara Falls election is at large. There's no wards. So you have like 30, 40 people running for the same spot. And nobody has a voice. When, so it's all about who has the money in advertising, uh, which actually, I would like to lobby the provincial government at some point to make some kind of municipal uh, changes there to their laws saying that you ha must have wards in um, municipalities. I think at some point I would like to <laughs> bring that on, but I got so many other things on my plate right now. Um, so um, I ended up running as an independent in the provincial election. That gave me a voice and that gave me a platform. And not only that, people started taking me seriously because what happens when you have all these old men trying to, most of the problem was because I was an attractive young woman and they are all married. And when a married successful person wants to have illicit sex, that person that they're having sex with has to be viewed in their head as lower than them and below them in order to make their affairs legitimate to them in their heads. So, um, so I'm being slandered all over the place as, and obviously I'm like a friendly, open type of person. I'm not, you know, like some hardcore person, but like I'm being told, you know, I'm stupid. And people are actually, like I eventually did get my high school diploma and a college diploma and started university. And, you know, there's rumors going around, I didn't even finish high school, you know, like, you know, like, you know, people coming up. I, I opened up an art gallery on downtown Niagara Falls. People are coming in and literally grabbing at my breasts and laughing at me. And I, I remember, you know, buddy, and one, one buddy going outside and I'm kicking him out of my art gallery going, get the hell out of my art, like, go, right? And, and I'm kicking him out the door, and there's a few guys waiting for him. See? See? She's crazy. She's crazy. And it's like, oh my god. Like, seriously? So I get to be the crazy person, the stupid person. And people are so really, like, it, it's kind of funny, because I'd, I'd have women, I don't even know, go into my art gallery, and they'd be like, ha, ah, making fun of me, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at them going, well, first of all, you don't know how stupid you look when you're making fun of me. So, like, I don't know who the smart one and the stupid one is in this equation. <laughs> but um, you believe everything that somebody just told you, and you're coming into a complete stranger, and you're telling that complete stranger the lies that you told, that you've been told. <laughs> and, and I'm going, wow. And, and these people who are coming in are people who work for the city, are, are people who are, you know, public servants who wear suits. They're, they're, they're not just like, nobody's here, right? But it, it, it's, it's absolutely stupid because, you know, they're, ma they're making fun of me and I'm like, wow. I, I, had, I called my gallery to Sunin Gallery, it's my last name. 
I had somebody come in going, ha, ha, ha. I know your name's not really Tusunian. And I'm like going, what? <laughs> and it's like, no, your name's really Tusani. You just did the I-A-N at the end so you can sound like Smithonian, so you can sound smart. And this person works for the city who told me this. And when the city listed all the art galleries, they actually put Tusunian Gallery owned by Jeanette Tusuni because they didn't want it, because they were told that that wasn't my last name. And everybody actually believed it. And I'm like going, wow. Later on, I turned out destroying a person's name is actually a degrading tactic that people use. When I was in jail, they try to destroy your name, and they can only call you by, by your last name, and that's to dehumanize you. And people were calling me by my last name and then screwing it up. And I had a guard in jail do that too. That's and I, I was talking to um, Howard Sapers at one point. I had a meeting with him, the corrections, and he's the one that let me know that that's actually a tactic. So I'm like, wow, I had that tactic on me even before I went to jail. So, <laughs> so that's actually pretty brutal that that happened. So anyways, they destroy my Niagara Art Gallery. Um, I run for politics. I say a lot of really wonderful things when I ran as an independent where people are like, wait a second, they're publishing her name as Tasunian, so maybe her name really is Tasunian, you know? Um, I ended up having a few people apologize for for treating me like shit, so I'm saying, oh god, I, I was stupid, I shouldn't have listened to those idiots, you know? And you know, people are like, oh my god, this person actually knows what she's saying, you know? Like, I remember one point talking about somebody about bids and tenders and other artists and stuff like that, and some guy going, sh sh does she know what she's talking about? She seems to know what she's talking about. And he's you know, talking to the guy next to me, and I'm like, yeah, buddy, over here, I know what you're talking about in the whole bit. So, I've gone through all this. It turns out I'm not the only woman going through this stuff. Not at all. I'm not the only woman going through this. Turns out I'm an isolated person who's going through this. And these buddies are doing this to other women they find isolated, especially in Niagara Falls where there's a lot of tourists away from their families and stuff like that. So amongst, you know, with this and also, you know, usually every week or two in the papers you find that there's all of a sudden, you know, pretty young lady being found, body found in the falls. You, you never hear anybody connecting these ever, but it's a hell of a lot of freaking women that happen. So I start actually finding some of the women who had the same things happen by the same people. And I'm like, going, good, let's get together and actually start doing something about this. So I, so I start getting them together and I start approaching the police in a more serious way. And the police aren't taking me seriously at first, but when I start bringing some of the other women in, they start taking me seriously a little, <laughs> a slightly. So, um, of course, the bad people who have screwed me over. Oh, I forgot to talk about the regional counselor. When I had my first art gallery, and I, I will say this because it's important, so I will backtrack. Um, I should have went with my notes. But... Um, there was a regional counselor who's uh, passed away several years ago, but he was alive at the time. And uh, when I had my art gallery, he was all like, hey, come to my art gallery, or come to my house. I have an art collection. Um, so you can view, which is normal. Like, if you're a director of an art gallery, to go to somebody's house to do a viewing of an art collection is a normal thing. So I, I go over there, and he shows me his art. His ex-wife was a photographer, showed me some of her you know, professional work and stuff like that. And he was a little drunk when I got there. And after he showed me his work, he whips out his flaccid penis. And I'm like, going, what? <laughs> oh, what the hell is that all about, right? And he's, and he's like, you want, you, you want to want some drink? I wasn't, I wasn't really expecting that. But I'm all like, no, 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 I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'd rather go. But, he, but right before he pulled out his penis, he was talking about um, how when he was a young person, and, and the way he got into politics is the Vietnam vets, he was bringing them in the Underground Railroad through Niagara. So he was bringing in Vietnam vets. And he goes, and then when that was over, then we started to run the prostitutes. So he was bragging that he, as a regional counselor at the time, was running prostitutes. And you know, just a year earlier, a lawyer you know, ended up trying to run me across the border, you know, which I, I realized I probably wouldn't have come back and I probably would have ended up in a snuff film if I didn't come back. So, um, so anyways, I'm like, I've got to find these women and do something about it. These people are finding out that I'm trying to do something about it. I go and I'm 
broke and I'm starving. I'm going, wow, the only way I've ever made money is by opening up an art gallery and people coming in and buying art. And that's actually, I, you know, I'm now well into my 30s and that is my career. That's how I make money. That's what I gotta do. I have to reopen an art gallery even though I'm dealing with all these crap people. I, I for a bit, I tried having a studio in Hamilton, which is about an hour away between Niagara and Toronto. Um, but uh, trying to reestablish a network in another area is like really tough to do, especially when you're used to a network in a certain area. And it was hard to break into Hamilton. Plus, I was still getting the haters from Niagara kind of trinkle into Hamilton and show up at my studio now and then. So um, I reopened my art gallery downtown St. Catharines. I wasn't even open for five days when. And I live in the back like I normally do with my galleries when I, I, in the middle of the night, I hear people breaking into my place. And um, I had a, a, a Great Dane puppy who was about 10 months old, but like huge. And she's, she's, but she's a puppy. So she starts going towards where the people are because she wants to see the people and have fun and get pets. And I'm going, uh-oh, right? So um, I take her out and I put her in my back, in, in the back, through the back door in a truck I was borrowing. And um, then I go in, and these people who are in my gallery, I hear them in the front, but they're not coming to the back part. And I don't know what's going on, but I'm scared. And I grab my cats, and I put them in the truck. And around this time, I start noticing that my place is on fire. So I leave my place, and um, um, I see that there's some people around and I'm feeling uneasy because I don't know if they're the ones who, I presume that they were the ones who were just in my gallery. So I started walking. Well, first I stare at the fire. There's all my stuff, my lifetime worth of stuff now on fire. And I get this like weird, like a sinking feeling and just, like shock feeling. And then I just like, wow, I can't look at this. I start walking down the road and these people start following me and I'm like, well, like, am I in danger? The police station is just like two blocks away, the fire station and three blocks away, maybe. Like, I'm like somebody, you know, like, I, I was actually headed towards the phone, pay phones across the street. I don't think I had my phone on me or something. I, it's, it's, it was all weird, but anyway, the next thing you know, police are coming up and they're like, where's the gas can? And I'm like, what gas can? Oh, that's the way it's gonna be. Handcuffs on me and put in the freaking cruiser. And I'm going, oh. Well, fuck this, you know, like, I've been through this situation with the cops before. I know that, forget it, I ain't saying anything. <laughs> I'm not even going to give them any excuses or nothing. I'm just going to shut up and not do anything. I'm fucked. My place is burning down. Everything I own burn is burning down right in front of me. It's, so I'm in the police station, and I'm going, holy crap. Like, I, I was there overnight. I get interviewed in the morning, and uh, the, the guy's just yelling at me, you know, but he doesn't even ask me if I did it or you know, what's going on. He's all like, you know, why you do it, brother? You know, like, it's like, what? <laughs> like, screw it, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> like, you know, what fire? <laughs> like, I'm like, what the fuck? Right? Like, I, I don't want to say anything. And um, um, so I ended up in jail and I'm, I, they just, you know, put me in jail. And I'm going, okay, so like, this is the police putting me in jail. And uh, now I got to go to the courthouse. And I go to the courthouse. Um, and, uh, you know, people are like, well, you got to go for bail. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to get bail. Who the hell is going to bail me out? I'm a woman by myself. I have like no friends or family. There's no way I could go through all the shit I've gone through and make friends. It's just impossible. <laughs> Nobody wants to be friends with all the crap that I was going through. You know, it just doesn't have, who's this weird chick? Stay fucking away from her. So, um, anyways, so, um, I'm in jail and I go to go to bail um, court and I'm like, that's impossible. But I'm in the back of the courthouse and the jail cell's in the back. And I get, they're like, oh, like, oh, your lawyer, your lawyer is here. And I'm like, I don't have a lawyer. Actually, I said I probably didn't want one knowing, you know, you know, they take me across borders to try to sell me. I just, mm, you know, it wasn't really, I've used some other ones before. I've had a few incidents with other ones that weren't really much better. And it turns out they're all buddies anyways. I think at one point, three of them got busted for cocaine. The lawyers shipping it across the lawyer. And, oh, a judge threw it out. Anyways, um, so... Um, the lawyer, a lawyer comes to see me, and he's all like, oh, I'm here 
to see how you are because your friend really wants to know how you are. And I'm like, who's that friend? It's like, oh, the lawyer. It's the lawyer who tried to bring me across the border. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, he wants to know if you're okay. And I'm like going, I don't know. Oh, they might have a bed for you in the psychiatric institution. And he's talking to me like I'm a little kid. And I'm like going, oh, Fuck. What? What the, yeah, I definitely don't think I want a lawyer if I'm getting visits from lawyers from the court house on behalf of their other lawyer friends who are all pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, are in the courthouse there to prey on the women, which when I was in jail and heard all the stories from the women of the same lawyers, yes, that's exactly why there are lawyers in the courthouse. Um, anyways, um, so I ended up uh, going towards a judge, and the judge was all like, Oh, yes, yeah, psychiatric, psychiatric evaluation, evaluation. You, know, you know, like, that's all I said. I, I went up, psychiatric evaluation, boom. So I had to go to St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton. They bring me back to jail in Vanier, it's a two-hour, uh, two, three-hour paddy wagon trip back and forth and all that. Ended up uh, going in front of a panel of psychiatrists in the Hamilton Hospital. And apparently I was booked for two hours. I was there for like maybe 10, 15 minutes for them to find out that I was sane. You know? And then they asked me, why did the judge order this? What did you do in the courtroom? And I'm like, I don't know. I just went in the courtroom and they're like, psychiatric order. They're like, did you say it? Like, what did you say? I'm like, I didn't have a chance to say anything. He's like, no, the, we've seen tons of people in here. This doesn't happen. They don't just send people in like this. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm dealing with no, I, I'm dealing with something else here, and I, I, and I know that I've, I, I, I've been in other courtrooms in other cities, and re, you know, right now I'm still you know, helping other people with cases and in courtrooms and stuff like that. And the way other courthouses go and the way the Niagara courthouse goes is completely like, it's like, oh, you're in like, places where there's fair judges and they're listening to you. Niagara court, everybody knows who I am and I'm already an insane, completely fucked up woman in these people's eyes. They've already heard all the stories, half their friends already fucked me up, and they want to fuck me up even more. So I knew at that point, I, I'm going to get convicted no matter what I do. And, um, and it's true, they had to bring in a judge from a well in courthouse to come in and convict me. The judge ended up uh, dying a couple of years later. He uh, turned 75, um, which is the longest he could be as a judge. and. Uh, um, ha died during heart surgery a couple of years afterwards. I'm like, I, was he on heart medication when he convicted me and fucked up with his brain a little? I don't know, but um, I don't know why the guy was still a, a lawyer, but um, wow. How long have I been talking for? <laughs> what? what? You, you of the arson of my art gallery. Oh, you, I'll be right back. Right, so I'm convicted of the arson of my art gallery. Meanwhile, I didn't do the art gallery. All these motherfuckers burned my place down because, like, they're going around raping people, and I'm going to, and I'm trying to find all the women to convict them. So this is their way to kick me out of town. And oh, what do you know? I live in Ottawa right now. So um, yeah. Um, so I ended up in jail, wrongfully convicted. Um, then I had to fight that. Um, well, while I was in jail, now we get to talk to the jail stuff, I'm sure most of the people <laughs> want to hear the jail stuff to begin with. But, <laughs> um, so now I'm in jail, and um, I had to prepare for a trial. Um, apparently, you're supposed to have the rights to have um, all the material, you know, access to legal references and stuff like that in jail that I found out. Oh, no, and no, just to even try to, not just the disclosure, I'm talking about, you know, you want to prepare, you want to know what motions are, <laughs> you want to know, you know, how to defend. The jail would not let me have anything but in a couple of hours one day to go over my disclosure. Turns out the 144-page disclosure that was given me to me in court wasn't the full disclosure, like that was that much. After I was convicted by the judge, and after I'm going, oh my god, I think I have to do my appeal myself, and I asked the, um, the um, uh, jail staff, can you get my disclosures, and I'm expecting that thin package of 144-page disclosure to come up to me. Um, then they come up with stacks of stuff, including a fire department report that actually states that the fire department didn't know the cause of the fire in it. That could have helped with my trial. Well, I'm in jail. I'm, 
Um, well, I didn't get legal aid. Like, I didn't really want a lawyer, obviously, because we knew know what the lawyers are like in the Niagara courthouse. But I did call legal aid at one point, and they're all like, you own an art gallery, and you want <laughs> you know, you, you claim 40 grand a year on your taxes, and you want us to fund you. It's like, well, yeah, I have no money. <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I claim. But then you have expenses, because you have to live. And you, then you get down to zero, and you know, and all that stuff. So, um, so they're like, don't even apply for legal aid. And, what not, but at, at this point, I'm in jail for a year, and legal aid is all, and I just, and I tried even getting legal aid for my appeal, and I tried, I think, two or three times, and then when I discovered that, about the disclosures, um, I found, oh, I found a lawyer who was interested. It took me a long time to even find a lawyer interested in an appeal, and they weren't interested until I discovered that I had a lack of disclosures. Then legal aid decided, oh, she's broke after being a year in jail. Maybe we'll fund her now. So then I got funded for legal aid, um, but I'm, I'm still in jail. And, and it was really confusing, because when I first got into jail, it's like, well, if I were to get bailed, even though I couldn't, because I didn't have any to bail me out, I didn't have any money to get bailed out, because in order to get bailed out, you need money or somebody who loves you, really, and I had neither of those. So um, that's why most people are in jail. They don't have any money and they don't have any family support. It's, it has nothing to do, really, with people being criminals. So, um, um, I ended up uh, losing my train of thought right now. <laughs> Somebody spark me. <laughs> Pardon? Your appeal. My appeal. You found a lawyer that was willing to. Yeah, I found a yeah. lawyer yeah. and he finally gone through all that stuff. But I have to spend my full year or my full two years in um, jail, so that kind of sucks. But while I was in jail, <laughs> anyways, I started off in medium security briefly until they told me to wear a bra. And I'm all like, no, I'm not gonna wear a bra. I mean, you're talking to me. <laughs> the, the person who refuses to wear a bra so much that I ended up changing a bylaw <laughs> in a pool and a fire, so like, And I know the laws when it comes inside and out when it comes to all this stuff. And I'm all like, no, you cannot tell me to do that. You do not have the right to tell me to do that. <laughs> this before <laughs> you want the argument and I have the argument you know, all there right so um, at first they weren't going to do anything about it and then well you have a different manager on all the time on different units and you know all, when you're trying to challenge something like that you have you know some inmates oh who does she think she is and you know and make up little stories and then they get little haters in the jail and they start telling the guards oh she's telling everybody to take her their bras off and I was like uh, no <laughs> you know whatever and then the next thing you know I'm being sent down to maximum security like uh, they're all like oh no we're sending you to maximum security for refusing using a wear bra and I'm like, oh, two years, two days ago you're all like, well, no, we're not going to do anything about it and now you're doing something about it. And, um, so I ended up staying mostly maximum security and I was thrown in segregation a lot. And uh, what time is it? Ten past nine. <laughs> oh really? Wow. Okay. So <laughs> I was thrown hey, you guys can leave whenever you want. Like, you have that freedom. You have that freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, he's, he's heard the speech before. He showed up at my another one. Calls at the beginning of the discussion, even if you continue, then some some people go to washroom and stuff like that. You know? Yeah, no, yeah. So I'll just go and just say the last part of this. And so I ended up having to challenge the um, the j jail policy, but I spent most of my two years in um, between segregation and maximum security. I had to go on a hunger strike. Um, t uh, in order to explain my rights, that you cannot tell me, you know, they're, they're all like, no, you have to wear it, it's the jail policy. And I'm like, so you, do you require the men to wear bras? And then they're like, no, it's like, well, then you're violating, you know, the equal rights standards here. So, um, you know, I had to fight that, I ended up, you know, meeting Kim Paid, got out of jail, <laughs> ended up here in Ottawa at the Elizabeth Fry Society um, halfway house for a few months staying there, um, challenged, um, the bra thing and the Human Rights Tribunal and won that easily and um, and uh, then fought my wrongful conviction 
And that I recently went to as well because I was convicted with no evidence against me. And as soon as I went to a Toronto court where, th where three court of appeal judges actually look at my trial and they're like, yeah, this person was going to be, no. Like, there was nothing there, like, you know, the, the, that, which I knew which, which was going to happen. Actually, that was part of my strategy. I'm like, well, if I am not a lawyer and I don't know all the motions and I can't get any information on all that stuff, then my strategy is just to let them fuck up and take it to the court of appeal because that's all I could do with a Toronto lawyer and bring it out of a town where I'm not being convicted because a whole bunch of assholes got a hard on when they looked at me, which is basically why I have a criminal record to begin with. So, yeah. Um, questions? <laughs> <laughs>